This podcast is brought to you by Adam Audio. Precision German engineering at every price point. Learn more at adam-audio.com. Hey, it's Larry Crane. Welcome to the Tape Op Podcast. What began as the solo project of frontman Will Toledo, Car Seat Headrest initially released a series of lo-fi and experimental albums on Bandcamp. The band's name is a reference to Toledo's necessity of recording vocals in his car while still living in his parents' home at the time. In 2015, Car Seat Headrest signed to Matador Records and recently released Making a Door Less Open, a stylistically divergent record containing elements of hip-hop, EDM, and even doo-wop. I caught up with Will to chat about self-producing and a tourless summer. Enjoy. Hey, Will. Oops, I need headphones. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, How you doing, man? Uh, not bad. Yeah, this morning I was um, making an edit um, for There Must Be More Than Blood. Uh, I just... Uh, got word that maybe that's going to be the next single for radio no oh, cool uh, but yeah shortening it down i had to shorten it down <laughs> a lot yeah well me and andrew were talking about that because you know it felt like a really good track yeah uh, but matador wasn't thinking about it at the time but i think uh some dj said hey it could be good so uh they changed their mind and now they're asking for it. <laughs> oh man. Is that kind of hard taking a song that, you know, you spent a fair amount of time getting it to where you like it there for the album, obviously, and then trying to excise parts of it just to get the length down. Right. Yeah. It was, um, especially going into teens of denial. Um, it was really difficult and we actually rewrote some of those songs. Um, to try and get them to the the 330 mark yeah and i've kind of found out the hard way that that's not what anyone wants they just want the they want the exact same as the album version but somehow twice as short <laughs> uh, so putting in the extra effort to to rewrite it is not really worth it but um so you just kind of have to have it in the back of your head if you're making a longer track um to have have a plan b if it does need to be that short right just kind of visualize like maybe just excising certain sections almost like yeah in, while you're, yeah I mean, while you're, this, this yeah. one was um, relatively easy because it's it's pretty flat you know it just has yeah. section after section yeah. and there's a long guitar solo intro which we you know i just cut that out yeah and uh, the middle section and that's already two minutes gone so then it was just kind of <laughs> trimming from there yeah, you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the songs and, and some of them, especially on the new record, have like the exposition or catharsis. You know, like kind of if you say like here's the the bulk of the song in the center, I feel like I hear sometimes or, or on the record you did with Fisk, there's the one that has the kind of beepy loop sound and builds up. Uh, Vincent, is that right? Oh yeah. You know, yeah. and then it turns into something, and then there's a lot of times there's a big kind of catharsis at the end that also, but then you're like, how do you not have those parts <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's that's something that i always wonder um and you know especially if if radio chooses a longer song it's like i think what you want is that build but how are you going to get it in that condensed format um yeah. and actually i got uh i got really mad once because drunk drivers killer whales we did an ed or we did a rewrite of that and spent all this time getting it down to three and a half minutes. Yeah. Um, and we did that because Matador had sent us this edit that they did, which was just incomprehensible to me, <laughs> just like half of a verse and then a chorus and then the bridge. Um, right. And then I found out like half a year later that that's what they sent out. They didn't bother promoting our, uh, our rewrite. When you, um, when you rewrote it, did you just end up like re uh, changing the structure and re-recording the whole song from scratch yeah yeah pretty much um 
all we kept in was the bridge, which is sort of the hook of the song. Mm -hmm. um, but the verse and chorus was very much abbreviated and it, it became a, a very different feeling song, um, which in retrospect, I can understand why you wouldn't want to part with the original because it did end up so different. But actually, after we rewrote it, the band was like, I wish we could just play this version because it's it's a lot simpler and a lot more uh, straightforward and kind of more fun to play. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the setup with a long song is that you just really have to commit to playing it when it's on the set. So um, right. if if your biggest song ends up being a long one, you better be prepared to to commit to that every night. And you've got a few, you have a few, I mean, there's obviously every album's got a couple tracks that kind of stretch out more. My friend used to say, I was in a band with her and she used to say, and we were both DJs and she said, play the longest song on any album. Cause that's what they really want to be doing. Is that the case for you? <laughs> <laughs> um, like, um, whether I, I prefer long songs on the record. Or? But that's where you're like, you know, uh, if you think of it like, oh, there's no commercial potential and this is where I'm going to stretch out and just do what I really feel like doing as opposed to trying to present something mm. that's, you know, digestible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely just kind of getting into a different mode. Um, you know, I, I used to just write without any sort of consideration for either commercial appeal or playing live. Um, I think that the practice of going on tour is really what's changed how I write the most. Um, right. Because, um, you know, you do, you know, if you're just laying it down for a record, then you can just get it perfect once and not have to worry about it anymore. But if you're laying it down and then you also, maybe you want to play it live, you know, you want to have that option, then you also have to m make it in a way where you can sort of change it. You can, you can be flexible with it. Uh, because if you can't be flexible with a song at all, you know, if it only really works in this one way, then it's not any fun to do live because you just have to stick to that. You got to be that very grid. rigid. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be rigid. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just kind of a song by song thing. And, um, that's one reason why our latest record had shorter songs overall, mm -hmm. but even the longer stuff, you know, it's, it's longer in a sort of jammy way where it's, it's flexible and you can shrink it a little or extend it depending on what the mood is. Yeah. And did you, did you kind of first start doing a band after the Matador signing, like putting a band together to really play out after it, getting um, signed or was... it, it, we lucked out where it happened at the same time. Yeah. Um, I moved to Seattle in 2014 Right. And was looking for a band. Um, you know, I had a, a set of demos that ended up being Teens of Denial. Mm -hmm. I was looking for a band to, to play with um, and wasn't really looking for a label. You know, I, I was hoping that that would happen at some point, but I had no idea how to look for one. So <laughs> I was focusing on getting a band, getting a live show together. Yeah. And um, so by the end of 2014, I was working with Andrew um, his friend Jacob was on bass and we had sort of a, a three piece going mm -hmm. and, um, right around then is we put out an EP called how to leave town, uh, which was mm -hmm. just kind of extra material from the teens of denial, um, right. stage, you know, I was writing a lot of stuff and how to leave town kind of came stuff that didn't fit on teens denial, basically. Um, and that ended up attracting Matador. Um, they got in contact and said, what are you up to? What are your plans? And luckily, uh, you know, we had the band and we were able to invite them out to a show. And um, so everything kind of took off at the same time. Yeah, man. Who? How did they find out about you? Or, I mean, you had records out on Bandcamp. You were self-recording, self-releasing, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was sort of a, a slow growing thing. I didn't really have any <laughs> industry connection at all for, um, you know, until Matador came along. Yeah. But um, we were, I was putting out stuff on Bandcamp and it got sort of a grassroots um, fan base, you know, just people online picking it up, circulating it, talking yeah. to their friends about it. And it, it just grew and grew very slowly. And then, um, what happened was someone that uh, 
Chris Lombardi from Matador had worked with. Um, it, I think, uh, actually, I think they knew about Car Seat Headdress for, had known it for a couple records at that time. Yeah. And they were interested in starting their own label and working with Car Seat Headdress, but they contacted Chris first and said, um, you know, they had kind of an agreement where the, um, they weren't going to steal artists from one another if they were interested. <laughs> so he, he talked to Chris and Chris was interested in Carsey Headdress. So oh, we ended up uh, on the label. I mean, that's probably, that's a really nice way, like a leg up, so to speak, or such, you know, because it's an established indie label and everything and, and just sort of a, sign, a stamp of quality, I suppose to the larger, yeah, it was, larger um, world, right? <laughs> it was a, a crazy stroke of luck. Um, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, there are a bunch of indie labels and you, you know, I was thinking that we could start with something smaller, um, but I didn't have any yeah. connections, you know, even in the smaller field. Um, we'd just done a couple, you know, cassette runs, one-offs with people who were just interested in doing that. Right. Um, but yeah, Matador really came out of nowhere, and that was a zero to sixty moment. Was that in the first record? Was the Teens of Style? Was that like a compilation of things you'd already done that had been on Bandcamp, or what was what was the exact yeah structure? Um, and I don't. I might have been planning on that even before mm -hmm. Matador came along, um, but it was just material that had been on older records, and I wanted to. Um, I wanted to revisit it. I thought I could do it a little better. Um, and Stuck. that's that's been kind of my downfall on a lot of material is that I'll finish it and I'll just want to huh. do something that... Um, an, ooh, I lost you. the connection. Shoot. Ah, okay, we're back. Hey, oh my god! Sorry, I uh, my internet's okay. <laughs> not great. I, <laughs> I wasn't sure I, which one. The studio. I think it was. Very I good. think it was mine. So okay. I switched over to my phone data. That should work better. Um, yeah, the audio is a little yeah, worse. Was, Are you recording the audio on your side? I am. I missed like the first okay. minute, but I, I recording. Okay, I'm recording now. That should work. That should work. Um, okay, but yeah, you, we can you, just send me that after we're done. Right. Um, so you were just saying you were just explaining like you were kind of had an intent of putting together a compilation at that point anyway, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, and <laughs> I don't really know why, um, but I always just want to go back and, and redo stuff, see if <laughs> I can do it any better. Yeah. And um, that was what Teens of Style was essentially, you know, just... And um, once Matador came along, there was more reason to do that because I knew, you know, we would have an audience now, essentially. You know, we'd, we'd go from having a very small audience to more, you know, more a lot more people were going to be listening to it. Yeah. Um, so Teens of Style was sort of an intro. If you just <laughs> wanted the basics, you know, of where we were coming from, you could listen to that record. Um had you, and, had you reworked yeah. songs for that? Did you take on older songs and like played them with Andrew and, and re re yeah, them? Yeah, like, yeah, Andrew yeah. was on it. Uh, Jacob Bloom was on it. He yeah. was playing bass at the time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we I rewrote a little bit. Um, m for the most part, I, I kind of stayed faithful to the, the song structures that were there. Um, but yeah, I... That's one I haven't uh, revisited in a while, just because yeah. it is, it's a strange entry. But, <laughs> you know, I, I'm always kind of interested in the these weird, like, non-album albums that pop up in a discography. You mm -hmm. know, if there's some sort of compilation um, where an artist is coming in and redoing something, I'm interested in that. So, um my own discography has ended up being kind of peppered with stuff like that. You, you uh, I, absolutely. I was one of my questions for you is like, is like, what is the impetus for like revisiting and re rewriting, rebuilding, or even on the new record, there's three versions of that, of the one song, right? Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> for me, it's, it's just 
all, it's all a process. Um, you know, you put out a record or a song at a certain point, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the only version of it um, or it's the best version of it. It's just yeah. the point that you got to at the time with it. Um, and, you know, if you're an artist, you get to a certain point and record it in the studio and um, and then you go play it live and maybe it, it turns out very different after you're playing it live for a while. Um, or if you're not touring, you might just record it and then you get a better instrument or, or a better studio space. And it right. just, you know, it seems like maybe the, there, there, are more poten there are more opportunities there. Um, and so, you know, I, I've always been interested in breaking down the idea, I guess, that once, once you put out the record, it's done and you move on. I think, <laughs> um, you know, in actual practice, that's not how it works for a lot of artists. So I just, yeah. uh, I kind of wear that on my sleeve. Does that allow you like kind of looking at, it, at each song is like, that's where it is right now. Does that allow you to also kind of move on a little quicker in the recording process to say like, to let go, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, it's always, it's always pretty slow going, um, you know, and that's just kind of the natural album cycle, um, mm -hmm. where you put it, you put it out, you tour for a certain amount of time, um, and then you make the new one and I'm kind of writing through all that period, you know, just putting us, putting new material together. And so I have the time to put stuff together and decide that it doesn't work, take it apart, um, put it together again, and just be going back and forth for a while during any album process. But definitely once I start getting towards the end of the process and you have to put the period in it, then it, it does help me to just think, you know, it is just a document of that particular period in time. And, um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to have enough interesting stuff going on in it mm -hmm. that if I come back later to, later to it, there'll be things that will surprise me and interest me. Yeah. And you, do you take a fair amount of time now these days putting an album together? It seems like you, you, you get a bit obsessive, even though you're able to let go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a it's, there's definitely a lot of back and forth. Um, Matt, you know, our most recent record, Making a Door Less Open, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had the advantage where when we signed a Matador, you know, I already had Teens of Denial done and mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to revisit Twin Fantasy. Um, so I had a long time to, to think of new material, basically what we were going to do after Twin Fantasy. Yeah. And... Um, I so saw that's what I did. You know, I spent a long time just kind of brewing on different sounds and different, different songs that I might want to work on. Um, and then once we finished twin fantasy, you know, it was about two years that we were kind of, that I was thinking full time about Madlow and, um, one year where we were really going through and, and putting everything together. Um, I think, you know, I, that's just the way that it's shaped out with car seat headrest. Um, I want to spend the time and I think you need about a year at least working full time on a record to make it something that, that, um, you can really go back to over and over again outside of that context. Um, and you know, that's what I want to make a car seat headrest record. I want it to be a little divorced, um, from its time, I guess, you know, I, yeah. I want it to be something where if someone stumbles upon it and they don't know the context, they can still get something out of it. And so that requires some back and forth, you know, you, you, you don't go with your original instinct, you, you change it or you develop it as it goes along. Um, but you know, th that's just what it is, what, what this project has turned into. There are definitely, projects where I do go in, you know, and maybe I'm working on someone else's record or, or it's just a different thing. And it just doesn't take that amount of time because it's yeah. more about just getting the energy that's there at the time. Right. Right. Just, just capture what's in the room. I mean, that's another way of looking at like a capturing where that's at at that point in time. That's what it is. Like you said mm -hmm. earlier, a document. 
Um, yeah. Where did yeah, you? And I mean, where did you record Madlow at the new record? Um, we were at a vast studios in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Um, but really, we would just go in and um, mostly do drums in the studio, right. you know, because that's the one thing. It's uh, it's pretty difficult to get anywhere else. You know, it's just you need the the mics and the room for it. Yeah. Um, we do drums and we would do live tracking, but we would just kind of jam on the songs. You know, I'd I'd have the structures set up. It, we would I would have a demo ready. But um, we wouldn't try to, to get it all the way there in the studio. We would mm -hmm. just focus on the energy that was between us at the time. Um, and so we would track like that. And then we would leave the studio and I'd listen to it, you know, after the session was over. And then I'd pull it apart and see what I could use and, and what, what I couldn't use. Um, right. And I would combine that with... Um, you know, with samples, with MIDI, with mm -hmm. whatever we could put together on the computer. Um, so it ended up being a real hybrid album, you know, between what we were doing in the studio and what we were doing oh, at okay. home. Yeah, because there's a lot of like program drums or or samples or loops or drum machine, different things on the record too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of it, uh, really the majority of this record I I associate with going to Andrew's house to do it because um, mm -hmm. Andrew had a, a more of an EDM background to production. Right. Um, you know, he was making his own stuff before joining Car Seat Headrest. And that was something I was interested in because I don't have much of a background in that. Yeah. So part of this album was a process of learning that, learning the sounds that are associated with that. And... Um, and so, you know, he would be at the computer and then we'd switch and I would be at the computer. And um, there was just a lot of that energy to it, you know, just just a couple guys at home just putting something together that uh, that sounded good on that set of speakers, basically. Yeah. It probably helps, too, to have a drummer that understands that music and has both backgrounds, but isn't going to be like, well, I wanted real drums on this part or whatever. He's Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, that that's ideal. And, you know, all of everyone that in the band is just so flexible about what appears on the record mm -hmm. um, because we're, we all just kind of process it part by part. And it's like, you know, we're going to be together on tour playing this. Um, so let's make sure that we're happy with those parts, you know, how we're playing it live when we're on tour. Yeah. As far as the record is concerned, you know, I don't think they're going to be listening to it on a daily basis so you know if if a guitar part gets subtracted or if it's computer drums instead of live drums no one's going to be upset because you know that doesn't affect them so much as what we're doing live so right. as long as it doesn't turn into just a mess of cables and and pre-programmed parts live i think <laughs> uh, we're all gonna stay happy with what's going on and do you think it's like you know, also bringing a different energy to a live show. You mentioned earlier about having open parts where pe things can stretch or whatever, amorphous sections. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's always just we kind of starting from scratch once we start thinking about the live show. Mm -hmm. You know, we make the record and then when it comes time to putting the show together, we really just have to think about you know, what's in the room, who, who's in the lineup at the time, you know, mm -hmm. last, the last major tour we did, we were playing with the band Naked Giants. Right. Um, you know, they were opening for us and we also were on stage with them. So a lot of what we did there was just, what can we do with seven people? You know, what, <laughs> how can we arrange the songs that way? And so even the songs that we chose, you know, and, we were doing covers and we were doing different songs and not necessarily uh, promoting the record as well as we could have been because it was <laughs> mainly about having that energy on stage and having fun with it. Yeah. Um, and so this time shrinking back, you know, we had, we had agreed with Naked Giants that it was just going to be for Twin Fantasy. So now we were shrinking back into a smaller outfit and it was like, how can we um match that energy or top it when it's it's a smaller lineup again and so that was kind of one of the reasons why we were leaning more electronic 
um, because that really adds to the palette if you can have live drums and then you can switch and trigger samples. Um, you know, if you can add synths, um, it just, it gives you a lot more to play with, even if you have a limited amount of members. That's so, true. you know, before quarantine started, we were practicing and we were figuring out ways of incorporating it in. And, you know, it, it felt definitely like the core of it was all live. Like we had control right. over what was going on. Um, but we just had these certain sections where, you know, it was going to sound different you know it was going to go electronic or, right. or go into a section that we couldn't have done before you know just doing everything live how did you do some of that did andrew start sections or trigger things or how did you, um, how did you yeah we we upgraded our equipment so we gave andrew um a kick pedal which just triggers samples um you know mm -hmm. snare and tom triggers and um yeah, we were just, we were in the process of going through the record and deciding what samples we wanted to pull right. and what would be better just as a live kit. And so it was going to be a hybrid kit that he was using. Oh, cool. Um, we also were going to use an Ableton push for parts. You know, he would go off the kit and just and play be tri pad. triggering samples yeah. straight up, you know, more wow. like a DJ. Right. And, um, that was yeah that was the main thing we were we were gonna be using a, a click um and i'm still will at some point it's this <laughs> is gonna be i know so so yeah. everything gets derailed by by the whole pandemic right and you probably were going to be touring all summer and and promoting yeah. the record and all kinds of stuff right yeah we hit uh <sighs> we did we definitely got derailed and right now everything is just pushed back pretty much a solid year you know yeah. the plan is pick that up uh yeah. next summer um yeah. and but yeah you know it's been um it's been a weird downtime for sure and mm -hmm. i've been working on a couple different things um but brewing up new material for us and and working on a few projects for different people um but yeah i mean the the live show um I'm interested, you know, I, I I have to not be as interested in it as I was because <laughs> I won't be able to get to do it for a year. Oh, brother. Um, yeah. But it's it's always the sort of thing where, you know, you don't want to plan too much before you go into it because things always change once you're doing it night to night. You, yeah. you figure out pretty quickly what songs work and what songs don't, and you have to adjust from there. So it's yeah. really like you want to start planning a few months before the tour is going to start and then you have a certain amount of, you know, you have certain ideas of what you want to do and then you can change it once you're actually doing it. Right. Or do secret shows kind of get things ready. <laughs> yeah. 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 And we did, we were going to play at Mass Mocha, uh, which is this museum in North Adams, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And that was going to be kind of our setup. They, they were offering sort of a week of rehearsals and then we could do a show um, to cap oh, it off. Cool. Yeah. And that, yeah, that got delayed too, but, uh, <laughs> everything, <laughs> yeah, that would have been the first time where we were really able to do like a dress rehearsal for a tour. You know, that'd be nice because yeah, we've got, uh, we were going to expand the lights and, and the set design a little bit too. Oh man, that'd be fun. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well it will be. I want to jump yeah. way, way back. Um, so the origin of, of your band name, isn't it from recording sessions in the back of your car, like find, trying to get some isolation? Is that true? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was, I was a home recorder and, yeah. um, you know, I was in my parents' house. This was in high school. I was starting, you know, I had already recorded a couple records um, under a different name and I was starting Car Seat Headrest. Um, just sort of conceptually is a different project, more experimental. Um, and I, I was, you know, sound, sound travels in a house. I didn't have any soundproofing and, um, I, uh, I wanted to be able to sing and not feel like the rest of the family is listening <laughs> in. So I just started yeah. going in the car. That was really the only private space I had. And, um, it was it was just vocals there you know i'd track yeah. everything else at home and then get in the car and, and drive somewhere secluded and just uh sing it however i wanted to 
So it was really just, you know, uh, probably one of the worst places to sing in, in terms of <laughs> acoustics or anything. But uh, I uh, all I ask. wanted was, was <laughs> the energy of, of being somewhere where no one could hear me. What were you, were you using like a laptop and running off your batteries or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, you charge up a laptop yeah. and you can get a couple hours off of it. So <laughs> I just bring it with me and, um, I, uh, had, had like a USB mic. Um, so it was, or no, I, d oh, I didn't even have a USB mic. I was using the laptop microphone. Oh um, my God. <laughs> and yeah, I would just be singing or screaming into it. Um, so it was, yeah, it was really just kind of intentionally, you know, just the lowest budget possible, yeah. the, the simplest option possible, and then just screwing with it in, in the mixing program. What were you tracking the rest of the, the instruments with? Um, I had a, 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 while, a lot of it was laptop microphone. Wow. Um, <laughs> and I had this, you know, little computer microphone, you know, this, if you bought a PC in the nineties, it would come with, you know, a basic microphone. I had one of those and, yeah. um, that was it for a long time. I think it was probably three years into car seat headrest before I actually owned a microphone that I was using for, uh, for recording purposes. Wow. That's kind of amazing. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of taught me, you know, it, it forced me to figure out a lot of stuff on the DAW, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how to mix it properly. Because, you know, I was starting with material that sounded super whack. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it did not sound clean. It did not sound good. And so I just would really screw with stuff until it started to sound, you know, interesting. I, I wasn't going for clean, mm -hmm. but I wanted, you know, sounds that were interesting to me. And so, you know, now working, um, working in a more normal mode, you know, you start off with tracks that are clean and then, um, it's, you know, it, it, I, I don't take it for granted when it, when it is clean. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's nice just to be able to work with that as a grounding and also have sort of the, the experience and, you know, if it's not clean, if it's not good, because a lot of times, you know, if you track live or, or if something weird happens in the studio, you end, you do end up with tracks that aren't, aren't as perfect and polished as, you know, an engineering handbook would, would want it to be. <laughs> Sure. And then, you you know, it's just problem solving in, in the mixing and, um, uh, that aspect, I do have a lot of experience in at that point. Yeah. Then kind of, you developed a, uh, a way of working. So yeah. Yeah. Kind of, kind of the, the backwards, <laughs> backwards from how anyone else would recommend it, I think. But I think we're seeing a lot of that ever since, I mean, you know, I'm way old and when I was your age or when I was your age starting like in high school, there were no four track cassettes. Like if you wanted a four track, you had to buy some kind of reel to reel that cost, you know, a thousand dollars and that, you know, who's going to do that, you know? Right. And it's like, there wasn't, you had, you had to figure out how to take two cassettes and play them at the same time to, to make, mix mm. more tracks together and all that kind of stuff. And it was really hard. And now you've got, you know, ever since home computers and PCs have been really prevalent, it's much easier to, find some way oh, yeah. to multi multi-track at least you know and to manip manipulate audio yeah no i i got super lucky um that i came up in a time where super cheap to record um and just a lot of people have that capability already just from having a computer or you know whatever's in the home there's just a lot of ways to do it and um i just always took advantage of that and different, different ways of recording too. You know, I did have tape recorders as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember some sort of setup where I would be recording onto tape and then setting up a computer microphone to get it on the computer mm -hmm. and then overdubbing, uh, like having a different tape and recording that in <laughs> and ending up with these overdub tape things. Um, but you know, all just stuff that I could do because it was, you know, it was $10 to buy a tape recorder at Walmart or whatever. Um, <laughs> right. and that, you know, that gave me the background that I needed to, to start figuring out what I wanted to do with music. And, um, you know, I think that you do see a, a lot of people doing it like that. Um, 
they but um yeah you know it's music that always does doesn't always come through uh because it's it's not marketable you know it's not uh, <laughs> polished stuff but that's the stuff that it, it interests me more to listen to and right. hopefully you would you know you do see more artists making it in you know getting a break or or coming into some sort of more mainstream recognition that you know has that background where they're making the weirder stuff right i mean i think you kind of mentioned it earlier like taking stuff uh that was roughly recorded but not just presenting it ragged or you know having a focus to it in some way whatsoever mm. you know by processing by arranging by whatever the techniques the work yeah i, I always tell my clients the work has to happen somewhere you could do mm -hmm. a record in a day if a band's really ready and wants to do a live record. You can do a record in a year, but the work has to occur somewhere along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, the other advantage of, you know, being young and, and having the equipment um, is that you're bored pretty easily, too. Um, <laughs> you know, if your mind turns towards music as a way of entertainment, then you can really get into the mode where you do spend a year making a record you know you you go back to it and you put the work in um and um you know that's just that's how i was coming up that was uh yeah. my outlet you know going to school or, or or doing whatever i was usually more interested in in going back to whatever project i was working on and, and trying to make it better um and yeah i i, I i'm in a chat right now with um some younger musicians who are doing the exact same thing yeah. and um i'm i'm trying to learn from them you know more than i'm i'm saying you know to to help them out because i think it's it is just a continuous learning process for me and um you know even stuff like youtube tutorials mm -hmm. you know the the engineer guys telling people how to mix um, you know, it, it's all useful and it's, it's all it costs is your time basically. Um, so I think, uh, just sharing, sharing as much as you can is, uh, is the way forward. Definitely seems that way. I, I hope it is. That's all I do. <laughs> 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 um, the, on like your last record, you mentioned the mixing process. How did you mix, uh, the new, the last record? Um, it was it was a lot of everything at once, you know, writing, recording, and mixing. Mm -hmm. um, really, I would I would lay down stuff on the computer, um, build it up in, in sort of MIDI demo form. Um, but then, if it if it had a good energy at that point, uh, I wouldn't want to deviate from that too much, um, you know, because I've done it. You know, Teens of Denial, we did have the demos. And we went in and re-recorded everything in the studio. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the benefit is that it's cohesive in that way. It's, it's easier to process as an album. Um, but you do lose something too. You know, if you work on the demo and you get it to a certain point, um, you can never get it to quite the same feeling if you're starting from scratch in the studio. Yeah. Um, and that happened with Teens of Denial and kind of happened with Twin Fantasy 2. Uh, when we re-recorded it in the studio. So I really wanted with Madlow to keep that demo feeling all the way to the end, you know, whatever the initial feeling was that sparked it and made me feel like it was a good song or good material, um, to just preserve that. So, you know, something like Can't Cool Me Down, you know, I laid down the drums and the bass and these vocals for the chorus and all of that pretty much got kept from the original demo to the final form. Wow. Um, and we confused a lot of people because we were playing it live before it came out and they were expecting a sort of a big rock version. And instead they got <laughs> the, nope. you know, the original basically. Um, but um, that was always, you know, the intent with it. And um, it was just a matter of, you know, good parts of the demo stay and this, the parts that are just filler or, or aren't fleshed out, um, yeah. just fleshing those out, you know, in whatever way we can playing it live to, to get a feel for it, uh, rewriting lyrics, um, recording different parts and it would all just happen kind of organically. Um, you know, just going back to that session, building on it or taking stuff out until yeah. it was all ready to go. 
and the mixing is just part of that whole process at this yeah point, really. yeah i mean if it if it sounded good just don't mess with it yeah. um and y usually it would be you know i I'd, I'd start off with it at my place and then i would take it over to andrews mm -hmm. and he had you know he has this the sub his his space is a lot more you can hear the drums and the bass you know the way yeah. they're going to sound in a car or on a better speaker system than mine um so i would send it over to there and he would work on the drums and the bass right. and get them sounding good there um and then if there was melody stuff you know or vocal stuff or anything in the higher end that was stuff that i could work on um right. so we kind of just parceled it out like that and there was a lot of um lugging my computer you know from my apartment in bellevue to his place in seattle yeah and um yeah it was just those two spaces for the most part where we were mixing it no it's kind of were there points where there were mixed there were things happening in both like your place and his place and you had to combine bits of sessions or yeah towards the end of it we were sort of pushing to get it done and and, and we would be competing with each other basically to, to get a mix done oh, um God. <laughs> but um yeah i mean for the most part he he wouldn't work on it without me and you know i I'd, I'd give him the go ahead or i'd come over and and we'd work yeah. on it um but um yeah it was it, there were a lot of you know we'd go down a path and then have a, a weird alternate version of something and yeah. um there's still a lot of that to sift through honestly you know yeah. we we kind of got the versions that we needed for the album and um there's still a lot of of detours um that exists that it would be interesting to go back and look at that sounds very much like the car seat headrest way <laughs> oh yeah 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 it's so, it was yeah i think it, yeah it really was just an organic process and um you know something just kind of grows and and you trim it until it looks presentable um but i really don't like messing with it too much or making it into something that is very straightforward you know arrangement writing singing right. um you know i, I don't want to make it feel like sort of the the document of the real thing i want it to make it the real thing itself <laughs> um which is diff you know yeah. it's just difficult to do that with recorded music i think if if you're in a room and you're playing something you know it's it, it feels a certain way and i think you know the hardest thing you can do is put that on record so i kind of just try to make stuff that has that feel even if it's not performed live you know right. it has that feel where it's being created in front of you basically yeah i mean there's there's a lot I've I've seen you mention a lot of like classic rock bands or the beach boys or pink floyd or whatever where a lot of that work is laborious work in the studio to build something that's kind of sounds organic and simple in the end, but mm -hmm. it was very intentional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, someone like the Beatles, they, I feel like they kind of got to a crossroads as far as playing live or being in the studio. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they chose being in the studio mm -hmm. um, yeah. and the world is better for it um, because <laughs> they were able to figure a lot of stuff out. Definitely. And, um, you know, those songs just feel so organic where, you know, they had the raw material and then they would have some sort of idea when they took it into the studio, what they were doing to it. And um, it, um, you know, it came to be in the studio rather than coming to be, you know, in a, in a live setting. And then you try to take it into the studio and, and capture it that way. Yeah. And then they, they, they did that with let it be and they ran into a bunch of trouble because <laughs> they wanted everything to be live and they they realized it was a lot harder that way to get to make a, a good album like that yeah. but um yeah they, they kind of established the model where if you want to make really good records you have to basically start in the studio you know you have to think of that as what you're arranging for and arrange it appropriately right i mean it was it was certainly a shift and it's an ever since we're all trying to catch up <laughs> right so the one of the things we you mentioned in the email to me too our mutual friend steve fisk and and steve you've you've produced technically all of the car seat headrest records out there except for uh teens of denial with steve 
And uh, what what brought that around, and what what was different about the process, and what did you learn and like and and not like? And uh huh. Um, I mean, yeah, that we had done Teens of Style, um, and it it sort of felt like I'd gotten to the point where I couldn't self produce anymore. You know, at least the way I was doing with it, yeah. Teens of Denial, that material felt like something that had to be brought into a studio which we hadn't done up until that point yeah um so i wanted someone who who knew what they were doing in the studio and who i felt like i could work with so matador sent a list of names and steve fisk was on there and um it was seattle people because i didn't want to fly somewhere else and, and be doing the whole thing somewhere else yeah um and I liked what, what Steve Fiss had done. You know, I hadn't heard of him before, but I knew some of the artists he'd worked with and, and I liked the the feeling that, um, you know, I liked the bands that he chose to work with and I yeah. liked what he did with them. Um, so I had a good feeling about it and he got sent the demos and um, it was it was a comfortable fit. It was an easy fit. Um, and he took me to... I think three different Seattle studios. Um, one of them was Soundhouse, mm -hmm. which we did most of Teens of Denial at, and one of them was Avast, yeah. which is where we're at now. Soundhouse, I think, is is kaput. Oh, that's um, too bad. I love that yeah, space. It, yeah, yeah, it was a smaller studio, and yeah. uh, but um, those were the two that we ended up doing Teens of Denial at. Um, you know, mostly at Soundhouse um, because it was cheaper. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, he he just um we we fit together well. Um and I, you know, I was approaching it, you know, n I'm not uh, kind of hands off, you know, I'm not going to try to do this the way that I had done previous <laughs> records because, you know, it was a different process. I knew that we were going into the studio and I didn't want to act like I knew what I was doing because I knew that I didn't and um <laughs> And so I, you know, I wanted to make it easy on Steve because he, you know, so he knew what he was doing. Um, and so I let him, you know, run it that way, essentially. And, yeah. and what we were bringing was, you know, the band who had practiced the songs and, and knew what they were doing in that regard. Um, and so it was just a very different process than the, the earlier car seat stuff um, because it was just, you know, tracking live and then overdubbing from there, but yeah. everything had that core of, of the band performance to it. Um, and yeah, Steve was just the right fit for, for allowing us to do that at the time. What kind of suggestions did he have on the basic tracking? Was he, was he getting in on tempos and structures and keys and things like that? Mm, not, not so much because, you know, I gave him the demos and they were pretty much solid. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that we kind of connected right away on what needed to be different from the demos and, and yeah. what it was going to be like. Um, you know, we were a three piece at the time and Ethan, who's on guitar now, was on bass. Right. Um, and I think we both just felt, you know, that's that's going to be the setup. That's going to be the structure that we're working off of. And um, he just did his thing and, and I mostly just tried to track on it you know I took pictures of his mic setups <laughs> and um I didn't I didn't worry too much about that end of it I yeah. just um I was more of a performer in that regard and then afterwards we took it to his place and we mixed it there and um we you know we were working on Pro Tools which I hadn't worked on before and so my contributions were a little bit more clumsy and basic than they would have been <laughs> otherwise um, and a lot of times I would go down a path and then just come right back. Um, and it, you know, it was just a process of, I would, I would add a little bit to what was there, but we really did end up with just, you know, stuff that felt more or less live. Yeah. What, what program were you working in before that? Are you are working in still or whatever? Um, well, it started out in Audacity, which is a free program. Right. And then I got a Mac a laptop which had GarageBand on it for free mm -hmm. and 
Then I upgraded to Logic, which is like GarageBand, but <laughs> costs a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. And that's what I was working on um, during this time, during denial. And I stayed on Logic up until, I guess, about two years ago. I switched to Ableton. Yeah. And Andrew had been recommending it for years. Um, you know, it was his go-to. And um, as soon as I, I started really using Ableton, it, it definitely clicked with me and I, I couldn't go back to anything else. Um, it just does a lot of what I want it to do. Um, you know, in, in comparison to something like Pro Tools, which is very much, you know, it's it's integrated into the studio, essentially. Right. So it's it's customizable, but it's it's not going to have a lot of input onto what you're doing. You have to set everything up yourself. Mm -hmm. um, Ableton, there's a lot where it is set up, you know, you can just run in and start putting stuff together, you know, start putting MIDI together. And it just has a lot of effects and, and, and things that I, I like to do with records that earlier I was having to, to do more of a setup, you know, to, to, to try and get the effect that really you can do pretty easily with Ableton. How, how do you find mixing in Ableton? Does that work well for you guys? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's about even with any other program, yeah. you know, uh, uh, problems that we have with mixing are, are typically uh, problems stemming from our lack of knowledge, <laughs> rather than with the program. Um, you know, with, neither I nor Andrew, you know, had any sort of schooling in terms of production. He watched right. a lot of YouTube tutorials. I did not. I mainly just <laughs> went by ear, you know, yeah. read what other bands that I liked were doing and tried to do that. Um, so, you know, stuff like EQ and compression to me, I, I didn't touch it for years. Um, I'm still just kind of getting a hang of how, ex you know, how those tools can be used exactly. Right. Um, so any, you know, that that was where the struggle came from, and that's going to happen on any program. But I think Ableton streamlined it, so it was easy to see what was going on, and yeah. um, you know what 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 we needed to fight, basically. And it allows you to. I mean, I guess one of the main points for you is it allows you to be creative faster or to capture ideas yeah. faster. Yeah, because you know I'll kind of get half an idea. And then I'll open up Ableton and, and start recording. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whatever that idea is, if, you know, I can track a guitar part, if I have a beat in mind to go with it, I'll just quickly open up a MIDI track and drag some drums in there mm -hmm. and just program it to go along with that. And, um, you know, I, I guess you, if, if you know what you're doing on any program, I think you can get, get that template. Uh, but I'm just lazy and I want to open up a, a blank program and already have something going. Um, so Ableton is good for that. And where do you work at in your home? Do you have a set, a set space or do you kind of just like, uh, just in my, in my room and yeah. where we're talking, you know, where I'm talking right now, actually, yeah. um, which, uh, you know, I mean, I'm in an apartment, so my yeah. options are limited. I think, uh, if I wasn't in an apartment, I would have a room, you know, yeah dedicated to this because it's 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 a drag to do everything in one room you know <laughs> not have a, a place to escape to right. um but um yeah i mean it's it certainly goes with how i've been doing it so far you know just wherever i can Definitely. get a, get a microphone and a laptop you know that's where i'm going to be working right the listener never knows or cares where it came from, right? <laughs> as long as they enjoy <laughs> no, it. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, you can get a way more professional sound just in a bedroom than you used to be able to. Um, yeah. You know, just so much of the tools for that come on the computer. And if you've got a decent mic, um, that's pretty much all you need. And a lot of practice on the program. True. Cool. Well, I think we got a good little chat here to yeah. work with, you know. And Will, thank you so much for taking the time on this and, and everything. Awesome. Thanks for listening. Find us online at tapeop.com, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time. <laughs>